Hello and welcome to the TLDR show, a podcast where I distill the knowledge of books just for you. I'm your host Abdurrahman and I'm very excited to have you with me. For our second series of books, I took a different turn. I needed light books that were fun to read and can be easily finished in a couple of days. And as I mentioned at the end of the previous episode, these books are very related to how the TLDR show became to be. So the theme for this series is creativity. If you're saying, well, I'm not a creative person, my answer to you is that creativity is in everything, from your job to how you arrange your room and even in making that late night noodles bowl. I wrote the episodes so that even if your career isn't in the creative field, you will find some great value in them. We have four books in this series, starting with The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, followed by The Steel Like an Artist trilogy by Austin Kleon. The trilogy consists of Steel Like an Artist, Show Your Work, and Keep Going. Each episode, we will dive into each one of them and learn some great insights. I do hope you enjoyed the episodes as much as I enjoyed making them for you. Without further ado, let's dive into our first book, The War of Art, subtitled Break Through the Blocks and Win Your Inner Creative Battles by Stephen Pressfield. When the foreword for the book include, he wrote it for me because I hold the Olympic records for procrastination. I can procrastinate thinking about my procrastination problem. You know the book will be a good one. But before we dive into it, let me give you a short introduction about the author, Stephen Pressfield. He's an American author of historical fiction, nonfiction, screenplays, and a former Marine. Stephen Pressfield is the best-selling author of fiction books including The Legend of Bagger Vance, The Gates of Fire, and The Lion's Gate. His non-fiction work include The War of Art, Do the Work, and Turning Pro. I'll leave links to his blog where he writes weekly, as well as his Twitter at S. Pressfield. Now, his ability as an amazing author appears in this book. It's written in a beautiful poetic language that conveys and stirs emotion and images, to the degree that I wanted to highlight every line and admire its beauty. And taking notes was even worse, since my words never seem enough to convey what I was reading and feeling. However, here goes my attempt to give you a TLDR version of The War of Art. The first part of the book is titled, What I Do. Here, Pressfield lays down his daily routine. Few things stand out. One, the number of lucky items that he equips for each writing session, a lucky sweatshirt, lucky charm, lucky name tag, among other ones. Two, how specific the routine is. Each step is followed by another till he starts his writing. These two points show how he conditions himself to perform. And the last point that stands out is what he really counts by the end of all of it. He doesn't care about the number of pages. All he cares about is that he had put in the time and gave it his all and overcome resistance. The book is broken down into three main sections, defining the enemy, becoming pro, and beyond resistance. Let's start with defining the enemy. I want you to remember, have you ever gave up on a diet, a hobby you wanted to start, a new year resolution that you felt to commit to? Do you sometimes, just before sleeping, imagine what would your life be, and the person you could have become? Most of us, have two lives, the life we live and the unlived life within us. Between these two stands resistance. Resistance include all and everything that stops us from pursuing a goal or a dream. It comes up the moment we want to commit to long-term goals over short-term pleasure. If you remember our example of Tim Urban's instant gratification monkey in episode 1, that monkey is a form of resistance. Want to learn a new skill? Resistance comes and says to you, what's the hurry? Take a break, start it later. Decided to stop a bad habit? It comes again as you say to yourself, I'm stressed now, maybe one last time. Want to leave your job to look for a new one or open a business? Resistance comes again and tells you stories about how scary things could turn out and sedate your inner desire. However, resistance also operates at a much deeper level. When we ask, who am I, why am I here, what's the meaning of my life, 
These questions require answers that are beyond what's encoded in our genes. We are wired to be part of and act as a tribe. Our years of evolution as a civilization only gave birth to the idea of an individual quite recently. Resistance tries to convince us that we should conform to society, follow what's laid before us, and be comfortable with the status quo. The thing is, following society's norm isn't a bad thing at all, but doing it blindly, or because we don't want to think for ourselves, is the issue. For you, if you choose to follow the norms based on your understanding, then great. If you also choose to embrace the freedom and the ambiguity of choice and be on what I call a lost man's journey, well, that's great too. So, how does resistance look like? Let's have a look at some of its main characteristics. For a starter, it's invisible. It's not physical, but it can be felt. It's a negative energy that distracts us and prevents us from doing our work. Not only that, but it's always pointing us away from the work. The rule of thumb here is, The more important a call or action to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. Although resistance appears to come from outside factors like family, career or environment, it's internal and comes from within. But sometimes after defeating it, resistance will need some help. Its allies could be friends or family members that, after committing to your new lifestyle or craft, they come and poke at you. They ask you, you're not the same person you were. Ironically, their comments could be reflections of their own struggles. In their minds, if you did it, why can't they? The best thing you can do is to act as an example and inspiration, and hopefully they will follow your steps. Resistance is also eternal and will never go away. Whether you're starting out or a veteran in your field, you will have to keep fighting it every day. Resistance also feeds on our fear and becomes most powerful at the finish line. When the end is in sight, it deludes us to relax and take a break. And there, we can be done for good. Now, this is how resistance looks like. Let's have a look at its symptoms so we can diagnose it. The first symptom is our good old friend, procrastination. Here is how Pressfield describes it. The most pernicious or lethal aspect of procrastination is that it can become a habit. We don't just put off our lives today. We put them off till our deathbed. We covered procrastination and how to beat it in our first episode of Predictably Rational. Give it a listen if you didn't. The second important symptom is an addiction to activities that lead to an immediate rush of dopamine. From scrolling endlessly on social media, to shopping, masturbation, TV, alcohol consumption, or eating junk food, If after finishing an activity, you feel empty and have a dread over what you've just wasted your time on, it's a symptom of resistance. Resistance also comes in the form of rationalization. Sometimes, it will find some legit reasons on why you shouldn't do the work. This connects to cognitive dissonance from Wim Bigley in episode 4. As a refresher, it's the mental condition in which people rationalize why their actions are inconsistent with their thoughts and beliefs. Let's see an example. When the weather is hot, which is the majority of the time nowadays, I'll delay my recordings. My reason is that if it's too hot, I'll be sweating and annoyed, which will affect my quality of recordings. Then I say to myself, just wait for tomorrow, it will be cooler, and you can start your recording. The cognitive dissonance is that I don't want to call myself a lazy or undisciplined person, so resistance comes with such rationalizations. Thank you, resistance, for protecting my self-image. Now, one of the trickiest symptoms of resistance is relying on support from family and friends. Let me explain it by a line from the book. Seeking support from friends and family is like having your people gathered around your deathbed. It's nice, but when the ship sails, all they can do is stand on the dock waving goodbye. This becomes very important when your support system is built around getting it from outsiders rather than from within. It's when comments from people on your progress get you to work out, or receiving praise from your boss keeps you going, or the number of likes and views determines how much you're willing to push yourself to work on your hobby. This is what Pressfield is arguing against. At the end of the day, when you're feeling down, you should rely on yourself to get back up, not on anyone else. Another point that I didn't find a term for it is how telling people about your goals 
gives you just enough gratification and a sense of accomplishment that you may just stop. Here's a story from this podcast. When I initially planned to release it, I posted potential logos on Instagram to ask for feedback. This act of posting gave me a small gratification feeling that just made me happy enough not to work on the podcast for days. So, what can you do? Personally, I think that if you want to seek support from family and friends, they should be the closest circle, the ones who matter to you. If you want to be public about a goal as a form of accountability, introduce a penalty. So, if you achieve the goal, hallelujah. If not, you will have to do the penalty. Now, Let's talk about the two good resistance symptoms that show you you are on the right track. The first one is self-doubt. It's an indicator of an inspiration to a higher level or a dream. If you're questioning yourself, am I a writer, artist, engineer, entrepreneur, chances are you are one, and hopefully on a path to a higher level. The second sign is fear. If you're almost paralyzed with fear, then you're on the right track. From our rule of thumb earlier, We can say that the greater the fear we experience, the greater the resistance. Fear also means we're going to experience something new, exciting, and thrilling. A title of a book that fits is Life Begins at the Edge of Your Comfort Zone. So, if you're really afraid, then stare down that fear every day and keep doing the work. Now, we know that resistance can be beaten. You've probably done it yourself a few times. I'll give you a second to remember one of your greatest achievements. Have a smile at it, and then come back to me. Now, we have seen how resistance looks like, and its symptoms. To fight it, we need to become a professional. When talking about professionals, we don't mean engineers, doctors, or lawyers. These are professions. A professional for us is an ideal to aspire to. The good news for us is that We are all professionals in one area of our lives, our jobs. Let's make some comparisons and see how you act in work as a professional and how an amateur acts. In your job as a professional, you show up every day, regardless of what's happening, the weather, or the amount of sleep you got. You still show up and you stay on the job all day, even though you could be daydreaming for two-thirds of it. But you still sit down and keep rolling. For you, the stakes are high. Your career could be the backbone for your family and dreams, so you keep mastering the skills and developing yourself. And lastly, you don't over-identify with your job. You understand that your job description doesn't reveal who you are as a person. An amateur, on the other hand, won't show up every day. If the weather isn't that good, they might skip a day or two. For them, the stakes are almost non-existent. Self-development isn't a need, it's a nice thing to do. They embody their career. This becomes an issue when facing failure and criticism. It becomes personal and resistance will slip in. It will create narratives about how this failure or criticism means that they are a failure as a whole and they should quit. What you as a professional do when faced with failure or criticism is to have a look and seek to learn and grow. You understand that the critics are in the enemy, resistance is. So you soldier on and keep moving forward. The idea of facing criticism will come again in each of the three next books. We will learn some tactics from the man in the arena to a boxing lesson, so stay tuned. Now, let's have a look at what makes you a professional. You're patient. You understand that this effort is for the long term. Likewise, you don't jump in and make unrealistic goals and burn yourself out in the process. You know that it will take longer than you think and a ton of hiccups will rise along the way. But you understand the reality and build a system around it. An example of a system is what Pressfield does in his daily routine. There is no goal in the sense of number of pages to be completed. There is a system of writing every day till he finishes his creative process. The same idea can be applied in many areas from daily reading, walking, exercising, or maybe your commitment to learn a new skill every six months. The focus should be on consistency and effort. Results and goals will come as a byproduct. Two side notes here. The idea of why building systems is more important than goals is explored in the book How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big by Scott Adams. The second side note is a good exercise to remind us that 
we will face adversity every day, from Marcus Aurelius. He was the Roman emperor, Stoic philosopher, and the last of who were called the five good emperors. In his book, Meditations, which is a collection of personal reflections that were never intended for publishing, he wrote, When you wake up in the morning, tell yourself, the people I deal with today will be meddling, ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous, and surly. They are like this because they can tell good from evil. This exercise doesn't mean that everyone you will meet will be bad. But when you eventually meet that a-hole of the day, they won't affect you as much. Let's get back onto track. Being a professional means you are a stoic. You understand that you can control three things. Your thoughts, actions, and reactions. Everything else is out of your control. When faced with difficulties, you don't get emotionally angry, and you don't take it personally. What you do is maintain your sovereignty over yourself. Being a professional also means that you seek order in your own right. You eliminate the chaos that can interfere with your work, accept no excuses, and you don't talk about the work, you just do it. The last piece of advice on becoming a professional is you incorporating yourself, or at least you think of yourself in that way. So you act as if you're managing a company, and it's only employees you. You can have your daily or weekly morning meetings, have key performance indicators that you need to meet, and annual goals to be achieved. When you review your performance, you look at it from a position of a supervisor reviewing his subordinate. In a way, you take the system from your morning job and carry it over to your personal life. If you're saying, that's too much, and I don't want my life to be like my job. I want you to think about what makes companies succeed over long periods of time. It's the system that they are built on. One of the key ideas I got from the book Zero to One by Peter Thiel, the German-American venture capitalist and a co-founder of PayPal, the idea was that how organizations as a whole can be treated as a social creature. What applies to humans in psychology can apply to companies and vice versa. If you see a system that's working for a company, there is definitely a way of implementing it on an individual level. So, incorporate yourself and achieve those quarterly goals. Now, with this, we know how to turn pro. There is no mystery to it. It's a simple decision. The last part of the book talks about the forces that maintain us in our journey, beyond resistance. Pressfield refers to these forces as angels and mooses. If you don't like the terms, we will go a bit using this mythical view and then switch to a more structured one. Mooses were the nine daughters of Zeus, the Greek god. Their task was to inspire artists. So how do we get these allies to come to our aid? Sit down and start doing the work. The moose will come and whisper inspiration into your ear and you will have that aha moment. And the angels will come to help us to evolve and grow. Now, the point of the personification of resistance, mooses and angels is that it will create a strong image that will be imprinted into your brain. In the movie, The Social Dilemma, They show the algorithm as a group of three people that are working tirelessly on ensuring that you're always hooked on to your phone. After watching it, every time I start mindlessly scrolling, I will remember them, and I just hate it, and I stop. The same will happen for resistance. Every time you come up with an excuse, hopefully you will have an image of an evil person that's trying to stop you from doing your work. For mooses and angels, they provide a nice image that can help you in the dark hours or when inspiration hits you. Now, let's go beyond the poetic images and see some concepts that I believe relate to going beyond resistance. The first idea is the types of luck. I heard it in Naval's podcast, which I referenced many times in the previous episodes. He talked about an article written by Mark Andreessen in his blog titled Luck and the Entrepreneur, the four kinds of luck. Here they are. Type 1, we can also call it blind luck. It's the one that happens out of absolute chance, out of our control. This would be like winning a lottery. Type 2 is the one that happens out of hassling and actions. This one comes from trying and doing many activities and actions, and as a matter of probability, we will strike luck somehow. 
Here, this could be us working on different projects, activities, industries, and eventually making a breakthrough because of the sheer number of activities we are involved in. The third type is the one that comes because of preparation and expertise. Here, because of these two, you can notice what other people are missing in your field. This could be in the form of starting a company that fulfills a need in your industry. In a way, in type 1 and 2, luck finds you. Here, you find luck. The last type of luck is described by Benjamin Disraeli, the English Prime Minister, who said, we make our fortunes and we call them fate. This one comes to people with unique characteristics, brands, or a set of skills. Let me give you an example. If you are among the best in the world of marketing, and a startup comes and recruits you, later, if your company becomes worth billions of dollars, then becoming worth billions is luck, but them asking for you isn't. You created it with your skills. The second concept that I want to point to is the flywheel effect by Jim Collins. He's an American author and a polymath. His book, Good to Great, is among the best business books out there. In it, he observes what makes some companies leap and how others fail. The flywheel effect is among the main principles discussed in Good to Great. If you imagine that you have a large flywheel that's 10 meters in diameter, and weighs a ton. If you are tasked with pushing it to reach a certain speed, when you start, you will need some Herculean effort. You may not even see any movements at the beginning, but you have to keep pushing. Then, at one point, you'll complete your first turn, then a second one, third, fourth. You keep pushing, and at some point, it gains momentum. Each turn builds on the energy from the one before it, and now, you don't push as hard, but you gain much faster turns. If someone came to you and said, Whoa, you're the strongest person on earth. How come you made it turn this fast? You will understand that from the outside, people only recognized maybe the speed at the thousandth turn, but no one saw you struggling till you reach it. We do the work every day and slowly start turning the wheel till it gains momentum. As you keep working, you'll start getting obsessed and your mind will follow connecting the dots, revising and correcting. A self-example from the podcast is when I start reading any of the books. In the initial stage, there is usually nothing. No theme, no linkage, or outside ideas. It's after I finish the notes, and I let my mind process it, that while taking a shower or walking, ideas would come up. Or just before sleeping, I'll hurry up and write them on my phone before they fly away. To paraphrase Hannibal from the movie The A-Team, I love it when ideas come together. In a way, this is my mini flywheel that I push for each episode. Now, the idea of why I'm bringing both types of luck and the flywheel is to show the importance of doing the work. For the three types of luck, two to four, they are based on your work. For the flywheel to start rolling, it's all about doing the work every single day. In our fourth book of the series, Keep Going, we will look into ways that can help us go beyond resistance. So, stay tuned. To wrap things up, I'll use the hero's journey as a metaphor. The hero's journey is a structure that you see in novels, movies, and sometimes in life. There are many ways to structure it, but I will go with the simplified, open-ended three acts. In our first act, we all have a calling within us to an adventure, a calling to our unlived life, and we refuse it. Resistance comes and gives us stories and reasons on why we shouldn't do it. It feeds on our fear and recruits allies when needed. So, we procrastinate. We get short doses of dopamine from shopping our food. We keep living an empty, unfulfilled, and unhappy life. Then, one day, we cross the first threshold. We get angry with the boredom, and we do the work for the first time. Resistance comes back, fighting harder than before. Its allies are all over us, doubting and shaking their heads at our change. Here is where our second act begins, our road of trials. We see the good signs of resistance. We start to self-doubt. We face fear and we fall in love with the work. For the first time, we see resistance for what it is. Ugly force that's dragging us down, but we push forward. But sometimes we fall short. We start rationalizing why we need to stop. We take failure and criticism personally. 
and there, resistance comes bearing its ugly head back, and we lose the battle. But as we're struggling, we grow and we turn pro. Our third act starts. Here, we get a better understanding of who we are. We become patient, realistic, and stoic. From here onwards, it's not a smooth sailing, but we have the angels and mooses to help us. We come to understand what the Telemann of Arcadia said in the 5th century BC, it's one thing to study war, and another to live the warrior's life. And we let the journey begin. We keep pushing the flywheel, and luck shall find us. I'll end the episode with the final line from the book. Creative work is not a selfish act or a bid for attention on the part of the actor. It's a gift to the world and every being in it. Don't cheat us of your contribution. Give us what you've got. I love this line. (laughs) I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know how did you meet your resistance. Did you manage to defeat it or did it get the upper hand over you? Send me your stories over Twitter or Instagram at The LDR Show. Next week, we will cover the second book of this series, Still Like an Artist, and see how there is nothing that's original and everyone is an art thief. As always, make sure to check the website at tldr-show.com for the show notes, links to social media, episode transcript, and the extra good stuff. The next time, be curious, be critical. Thank you.